What are the big questions? Big questions. Big questions. Who made me? And why am I here? It does not matter whether you are atheist, agnostic, Jewish, Christian, Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist, it does not matter. Everybody at some time in their lives asks themselves, who made me and why am I here? Revelation tells us what not to do and the consequences of that. It tells us what to do and the benefit to be gained thereby. And it gives us a troubleshooting guide. In other words, it tells us how to sort ourselves out if we have a problem, how to correct our deficiencies and guide ourselves aright. Now, if you meet the specifications of what your duties are, you will reap the reward. And if you are an employee who is substandard, what happens to you? You get fired. Think about that word, fired. The consequence of underperforming, the consequence of not meeting standards. That word did not come from nowhere. In the past, the people who were developing the English language looked around and said, how should we describe somebody who is a failure? What happens to them? In the same way that a person who is a failure in life finds the fire in the hereafter, the employee who is a failure on his job gets fired. So let us not be failures in life and let us not be failures in the hereafter. So, Hopefully by this point, we have agreed that as we are creation, there is a creator. That as everything we make for the purpose of serving us, our creator made us to serve and worship him. We are then talking about how. The owner's manual, the manual of specification for us is the manual of revelation. Why? What is the need for revelation? Isn't it enough for all of us just to be good? Now, all of you know I am not dreaming up these questions by myself. All of you have heard other people asking these questions. Yeah, sure, I believe there's a God. Yeah, okay, I, I know I believe there's a God, and I know I should be serving and worshiping him, but it's enough just to be good. I'm a good person, that's enough. So isn't that enough? The answer is no, it's not enough. Why? Well, to begin with, we have to examine the reason for revelation. Our creator is fair and just. Our creator is fair and just. When we die, we are going to the day of judgment where we are going to be evaluated and assigned either to punishment or to paradise. Would it be fair for that assignment to be arbitrary? We are going to stand in front of a court. Think about a court for a minute. To establish justice, you need four things. You need a judge, you need a court, you need witnesses, and you need a book of laws. If you do not have any of those four things, how can you establish justice? And on the day of judgment, the judge will be Allah, the book of laws will be the Holy Quran, and the witnesses will be the elements of creation, and the court will be the day of judgment. Now, it is by those four things that we will be measured. The angels who are in attendance with us from the day we are born until the day we die, will bear witness. Our own hands will bear witness to what they have wrought. Our own tongues will say what has passed through it. 
We will bear witnesses against ourselves. The angels will bear witnesses as well. Other elements of creation who have witnessed our deeds will be there as well. And there will be no deed, large or small, that will be missed. Those will be our witnesses in the courtroom of the Day of Judgment. And we will be measured by what? By a book of laws. And we will be judged by who? By Allah. Now, if Allah did not have that book of laws, would he be establishing justice? No. If we were assigned a place in, in the hereafter without having a chance to guide ourselves aright in this life, then that would be injustice. The same as you, if you went to a court here and they, they either let you go or put you in prison based on nothing, as if the country had no laws. So how do you know what is right and what is wrong? Now, why else do we need revelation? Back to the question, isn't it enough just to be good? What is good? What is good? Good is defined by our Creator, not by us. Go and gather a hundred different people together and ask them, what is good to you? And you will get many different answers. Obviously, there are criminals out there. There are criminals out there who enjoy being criminals. They enjoy certain crimes. And for them, that is good. There are tyrannical leaders throughout history who have led their entire populations to destruction. Men like Pharaoh, military leaders who have led their people and their armies and their countries to destruction on the basis of misguidance because they set the rules for themselves instead of accepting the guidance of our Creator. Mankind cannot agree on social justice, economics, politics, laws. We cannot agree. So what is good if not what is defined by our Creator? It is interesting that it is in the field of religion that mankind presumes to write its own rules. How many people here, I want you to raise your hands, how many people here entered your job, walked up to your boss, and said, thank you for the job, but you know what? I'm going to write my own job description. I'm going to write the, my own rules. I am going to dictate to you what I'm going to do, and then you've got to pay me. I don't see any hands up. There's a reason for that. I asked my father this. My father is not a Muslim. May Allah guide him. I was talking to him and I said, Dad, imagine that when I was a child, imagine that I came home one day and I said to you, Dad, you know, I recognize your existence and I thank you for everything that you've done for me, but you know, I've decided to rewrite the rules of the household. From now on, we're going to do things my way, and you're going to like it. I said, now, Dad, what, what would you say to me if I did that? And he said, son, I'd tell you to go to hell. Think about it. Now, that is a very human response, but that is expected to be Allah's response. Those of us who presume to write our own religion, to set our own rules, to do what we feel we want to do. We are following nothing but our own desires. And that is not the example of the righteous. That is not the example of the pious throughout time. Why can't we worship God in our own way? Another big question that comes up. Why can't we worship God in our own way? I'll tell you why. I'm in India. I came from Saudi Arabia. I was born and raised in America. But you know what? There are places here where if I go and I eat a meal, they will not take my Saudi rials. 
and they will not take my American dollars. Do you get the point? You have to pay with the currency that is accepted. Once again, you can't make your own rules. You have to pay with the currency that is accepted. If you are not paying with the currency that is accepted, you will be in default. Think about any laws that you have ever been subjected to, city, state, international. They have all been written by men. They have all been designed as guides, but over them all are the laws of God Almighty Allah. That is the guidebook for our lives, and that is what leads to paradise in the hereafter. Now, let's talk for a minute about this concept of the accepted currency. What is the accepted currency in terms of revelation? Well, if you are a believer in any of the monotheistic faiths, Judaism or Christianity or Islam, you follow the chain of prophethood to its conclusion. I can quote to you passages in the Old Testament which predict three prophets to follow, John the Baptist being the first, Jesus Christ being the second, and obviously pointing the way to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as the third. I can then point to passages in the New Testament which, in which Jesus Christ alluded to the final prophet to follow. All of you who have been following Peace TV, who have been following the teachings of Dr. Zachar Naik, knows that he can ripple off the books and the verses in which the Hindu scriptures predict the final prophet, the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Now what have we discussed up until this point? Again, I may sound like a broken record going over these points, but I like to summarize. Inshallah, we have agreed that as we are creation, there is a creator over all things. Inshallah, we have agreed that the purpose in our life is to serve and worship him. And Inshallah, we have agreed that the way in which we serve and worship him is to follow the book of his guidance, Revelation. What I am now going to take a minute to discuss is why we should consider Islam as the completion of that revelation. I'm going to start with what I know best, which is the monotheistic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. So let's take it out of faith. The Old Testament predicted three prophets to follow. John the Baptist was one. Jesus Christ was the second, leaving. 3 minus 2 equals 1. Now, we would expect that it makes sense that Jesus Christ, if there were a prophet to follow him, would have mentioned the fact, maybe not directly, but in some way. This takes us to John chapter 14, verses 16 through 17. In these verses, Jesus Christ speaks of his going away. He says, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth. Let's not read it in the translation. Let's read it in the manuscript from which it is translated. Notice I am being very careful with my words. I am not saying let's read it in the original. There is no original. Make no mistake about it. The Bible is translated from Koine Greek. Jesus Christ spoke Arabic. The authors of the Bible, who wrote the different books of the Bible, were writing in a language Jesus Christ did not speak. It is a translation. There is no such thing as the original Greek, but it's the best we have. Everybody who has ever done translation knows that when you make a translation, something gets lost in translation. But, as I said, it's the best we have. And what the passage says in Greek is allos parakletos. Allos meaning another, parakletos meaning paraclete. Now, paraclete has been fought over. It has been argued about. What does paraclete mean? It has been translated helper, advocate, 
assistant, Holy Spirit, comforter. I'll tell you right now, in the phrase allos parakletos, it doesn't matter what parakletos means. The word that is important is allos, another. Why? Because in the first epistle of John, chapter 2, verse 1, Jesus Christ is identified as a paraclete. Read it in the Greek. Don't read it in your translation. It states that we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. The word translated to advocate is paraclete. Now, what is the conclusion? The first epistle of John 2.1 tells us Jesus Christ was a paraclete. Then Jesus Christ tells us that at the end of his mission, following his mission, another paraclete, Allos Paracletos, will come. What is the obvious conclusion? Whatever Jesus Christ was, a prophet, he is telling of another to come, another prophet. Does it not make sense that when we are told in the Old Testament of three prophets to follow, when we find two of those prophets in the New Testament and the last of them speaking of the final prophet to come, does it not make sense to follow the chain of revelation to its conclusion, to embrace the final prophet predicted by the previous books of Scripture, to acknowledge Muhammad, peace be upon him, as that prophet. I would mention, again, if you look in the New Testament, you only find this word, paraclete, mentioned five times. In these five times, it is mentioned that the one who will come will honor Jesus Christ, and he will be the spirit of truth. It's interesting to note that in the life of Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, even his enemies, even his enemies knew him by the title of Asadiq al amin the truthful, the honest. And Islam is the only religion, it's the only major world religion that honors Jesus Christ as he deserves to be honored as a prophet of Allah. I am a doctor. We have a saying in the field of medicine. When you hear hoofbeats, think about horses. Don't think about zebras. When you see a lot of evidence suggesting that this person has a certain disease, a certain common ailment, don't go looking for the odd, strange, the rare things. When you hear hoofbeats behind you, think of horses, not zebras. There is an obvious conclusion to all of this. It is the conclusion that leads to paradise. And there are many ways of denying it. And every one of those ways of denying is a going astray. And every one of those paths of going astray lands you in the fire. Please. Accept the obvious, accept what is clear, and model your lives around it. I was telling the story the other day of a time when I attended an ice sculpture festival. Now, many of you may not know this, it's kind of a hot country for ice sculptures, but in some countries they have ice sculptures. We went to this vast array of ice sculpture. There was, there was one sculpture of a truck. You could see it with your eyes. It's a truck. There's no doubt about it. I mean, it has wheels, it has a hood, it has a steering wheel. Anybody can look at this and know that it's a truck. But the person who was with me opened their guidebook and said, you know, that's a locomotive, the head car for a train. And I said, what are you talking about? And they said, 
it says in the guidebook that this is a locomotive. And I said, use your eyes. It's a truck. We, we see these on the road how many times a day? This is a truck. They said, no, no, it says right here it's a locomotive. I argued, I walked them around it, I showed them all the features of a truck that a blind man could feel his way around and identify that this is a truck, but this person can see it with their own eyes. In the end, it just so happened that the sculptor walked by and saw us arguing about what this is, identified himself, and I said, okay, look, just, just settle the argument. Is it a locomotive or is it a truck? And he looked at us as if we were a little bit crazy, and he said, well, at first I said I was going to do a locomotive, so that's what they put in the book, but at the last minute I changed my mind, I made a truck. It doesn't stop there. The person who was with me said, you know, I still think it's a locomotive. Now, we are talking to the person who made it. We are talking to the person who made it and we can see with their eyes. Please, not for me, for yourselves, for your families, for the lineage that is going to follow in your wake, for your children, your grandchildren, and all who will follow until the day of judgment, accept what is clear in front of your eyes. The Holy Quran is revelation from Almighty God, Allah. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was his final prophet. And if you have any doubt about this message, pray to God for guidance, pray to our Creator. Just use that term. Pray to our Creator with sincerity, asking Him to guide you to the religion of truth. Study, watch Peace TV, stay tuned to the channels that will broaden your mind and improve you and guide you to a good end. And I thank you very much for welcoming me here. That concludes my talk for tonight. Jazakallah khaira, Dr. Lawrence Brown, for your very inspiring talk. Indeed, you raised those big questions, and speaking for myself and I hope for all of you, I think he did a great justice in answering them. So may Allah bless you and protect you and reward you, Dr. Lawrence Brown.